Good, good, good. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Thank you for being at Plainfield Christian Church. Um, I apologize if my voice doesn't carry as well. I'm getting over a cold because that's going around. So fan. Fantastic. So anyway, I just want to run through a couple quick announcements for you guys this morning be, before we start worshiping. Uh, our first one is we got uh, Hand to Hand that we've been supporting all year, which has been incredible. I think there's a slide. There it is. Yeah. So um, our next packing will not be this, this coming Wednesday, but the Wednesday after that, uh, November 16th. We're packing all like 160 some meals that 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 we need to pack. So um, if you are interested in doing that, then see Leslie Poo, who's I don't see her here this morning. She's probably at home sleeping. Um, she, she probably put her clock back on accident. Well, I mean, probably put it forward. It's her, I don't know. She's just not here. She's not here. That's that's kind of the bottom line. So, but if you have any questions about that, see her or uh, see myself, and I can and I can help you out with that. Um, but that's an awesome ministry that uh, we got going. Um, second, next, or starting next Sunday morning, uh, a fine gentleman in our congregation by the name of Conrad Daniels. Yeah, Conrad, right there. Raise your hand, buddy. There he is. That good-looking fella right there. Um, he is starting a new Sunday school class next Sunday morning at 930. Uh, right over here on the other side of this wall, there's a hallway in that middle classroom. He's going to start a uh, Sunday school series on the book of Hebrews, right? Okay, um, so if you want to know more about Hebrews and, and how to make coffee, um, that's a joke, because get it, Hebrews? <laughs> uh, uh, okay, I'm not that funny. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, but if you, want to learn, if you want to learn more about the Bible and about Hebrews, then uh, see, see Conrad next weekend. Um, and then we are also in need of some people to help um, prep communion uh, on Sunday mornings for the months of, J uh, of January and August, okay? So it's not that hard. It's pretty easy to do. Um, so if you are interested in doing that, then see Trisha Butler, who's back there in the corner. She's raising her hands right there behind Norm, okay? Um, so if you, if you are interested in, in uh, doing that, then uh, please see her or my wife, Linda, or myself, and we can definitely help you out with that. And then lastly, um, out here at the Welcome Center, there is a Lost and Founds rack of stuff, okay? So if you have maybe lost like a pie plate or hearing aids or um, a wallet, I don't know. If, but if you think you have lost something here, then please check out the uh, Lost and Found um, because in two weeks, that's all going to be donated um, to some place around here. My wife knows, but I don't, because um, that's on a need-to-know basis, and I don't need to know. Um, but if you if you are missing something, then uh, please see the Lost and Found and uh, claim your stuff. Or even if you just want something, maybe because Christmas is coming up. Okay. Um, Nothing like, nothing like a freebie from the lost and found. So anyway, thank you so much for uh, being here this morning. Uh, we are just so thrilled that you are here. God is pleased that you are here. And um, we hope that you guys are ready to worship this morning. So thank you so much. Pass off to Katie. This is this year's planning team for Rafa House. And um, we prayed and God blessed us. And we are extremely excited to announce we raised twenty-five thousand fifty-six dollars and fifty-eight cents this year, going to Rafa House. We have a short video from um, Angela Foster from Rafa House. Good morning, Plainfield Christian Church. Amazing, absolutely amazing. $25,056.58. You blew your goal of $18,000 right out of the water, and we are so incredibly thankful. One of the things that makes this partnership so unique is that you have never, in all these years, asked us to designate these funds. But I would love to share with you a critical need that we have right now in our Haiti aftercare facility. Over the summer, we have had three babies born, one to an 11-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 13-year-old. We already had three babies, one that moms had come to us with their babies. So we have six babies and their mamas in our care. All the expenses that go with babies and mamas, 
Uh, we just appreciate so much and really feel that this is the Lord providing additional funds for us to provide for these babies. So from the bottom of our hearts, Rocka House and myself, thank you so much, Plainfield Christian Church. In the legal world, uh, the first question always asked in an argument is, uh, what authority is there to support your argument? What law applies? Uh, what does a higher court have to say about it? Does the court you're bringing your argument to even have jurisdiction? Does the officer or government official or prosecutor have the authority to even bring the charge? So basically, in our terms, the question is, what right do you have? Uh, if you can't provide the proper authority first, then your argument is going to fall on deaf ears. Words are just words if you can't back it up with the proof that you or the court can do what you are requesting. So it should be no surprise to you that one of my favorite stories in the Bible is when Jesus healed the paralyzed man that was lowered through the roof. And if you remember, he's lowered through the roof, and I'm going to read, Matthew chapter 9, Jesus uh, sees the paralyzed man. And just then, some people were carrying a paralyzed man lying on bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Then some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, perceiving their hearts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven? or to say, stand up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, stand up, take your bed, and go to your home. And he stood up, and he went to his home. When the crowd saw it, they were filled with awe, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to human beings. You see, Satan can't, can pretend at times, but Satan doesn't have the authority to heal anyone. Man can never heal, not like that, not, not with only words. Only the God of the universe has that power. Only the God of the universe has that authority. So when the God of the universe says to the leper, dip yourself seven times in the Jordan River, you go and you dip yourself seven times in the Jordan River. When the God of the universe says that in order to have a covenant with him, you need to bury yourself in the water and rise anew. We get into the water. When the God of the universe says, go into all worlds baptizing and making disciples, we go, we baptize, we make disciples. When the God of the universe says to remember him, as often as we come together, we come around this table as often as we come together. However, all that obedience is great and is expected when you follow Jesus. But the truth remains that we fail. And trust me, we fail often. So the best news about all my legal, legal mumbo-jumbo this morning about authority is this one simple fact. The next time Satan whispers in your ear, or a family member, or a co-worker, or a neighbor, or God forbid, even a brother or sister, that your sins are just too many to be forgiven. Guess what? They don't have the authority to speak on the matter. Only one can forgive your sins, and his name is Jesus. And he assures us in his word that he loves us, loves us so much that he came from heaven to endure a cross, making himself a propitiation an atonement for all, and that he, the only one that has authority to say so, has forgiven all of your sins. And that's why we come here today. All he asks is for you to follow him, which includes coming around this table, remembering him every time that we come together, and that's why we do so. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come before you on bended knee this morning because we recognize that under the law, we are guilty. Guilty of everything, guilty of all things. 
but that through your blood, Lord, through the sacrifice that you made for us, through your authority over heaven and earth, life and death, that you've forgiven us. You've made us new. You've washed us clean. And that when we stand within you, guilt flows off us like water off a duck's back, Lord. So we just pray that as we come to this table, as we remember as you command us to do, that we would remember your love, your sacrifice, and your willingness to be ours as we are willing to be yours. It's in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for uh, this morning, and we thank you for uh, just all the blessings that you give to us. And uh, most importantly, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who is the greatest blessing of all. And uh, Father, as we get ready to um, just show our faithfulness to you by giving back um, some of what you have uh, given to us, Father, we, we truly ask that you would just take that and, um, and, and, and just bless it to to let the people around us know that you are here, that you are real, and that Father, uh, you, 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 uh, you uh, love them deeply. Um, so, Father, just do what only you can do. Father, we thank you and uh, we love you because you love us. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. No, I hang on to the chair. Uh, I welcome you all here this morning, and I want to ask how many people believe in the power of prayer. I can tell you firsthand, and I know you folks have been praying for my health and well-being for a long time. I still have health problems, but I've managed to get away from. The, 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 the um, oxygen. And three weeks ago, I walked my first mile in over two, year, two years. And <laughs> since, since three weeks, I have managed to walk at least a half a mile two, three times a week, and also three more miles. And I don't know what God's got and plan for me, but I know he wants me here and not in heaven yet because I've been on death doors too many times this summer. But I just want to thank you all very much for your prayers and your wishes and your well beings, and thank you very much. That's actually- I tell you, Bernie, I've uh, prayed for your health lots of times, but not your well-being. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't surprise me, and heaven doesn't watch you yet. I'm not sure. Oh boy. Well, we're glad you're with us. We know Marilyn; she's. Kind of up in the air about you being with us, but 482 is our hymn of decision. And uh, I'm glad that Rafa House is in Haiti, aren't you? And there are so many real issues in our world. I mean, we wonder, does does God still have a place in this world? And when we hear that an 11-year-old is given birth and a 12-year-old is given birth, our God needs to be in people's lives because that just is incredible. And how thankful I am that uh, Rafa House is there and thankful to you that uh, uh, you can do uh, uh, this with your giving. 
And um, hopefully we can give these uh, babies, I don't mean the newborns, I mean the girls that have given birth, give these babies a chance uh, to turn their lives into something that uh, uh, gives them some happiness and hope. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 13, please. We are on number six of the parables. Uh, the last three, I told you last week, are uh, given only to the disciples. And um, uh, this one today is just a, a, a wonderful, exciting, amazing um, parable uh, that uh, I, I'm excited to share with you today. But before we begin, uh, please join me in a word of prayer. Father, thank you today for allowing us to be here in your presence. And we thank you for a, a, a country that allows us still to be on our own, to go where we want, and to worship you without fear of repercussion. And as we've gathered here this morning to hear a word from your throne, I pray as always that our hearts and minds would be receptive as we ask your Holy Spirit to come in and speak to us. And Father, I pray that when we leave this building today, our appreciation and our love for you would soar. The songs that we've sung and the meditation that we've heard all leads us to this point where we're ready to give you great glory and honor and praise for what you have done for us. Help us to see that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just read this parable to begin with. It starts in verse 45. It says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now this links very closely with last week's parable, the parable of the hidden treasure in the field. A man found it, he, he covered it up again, and he bought the field. And probably because the parables seem so similar, the common interpretation for them both is quite similar. Now this isn't the right one, okay? So don't be writing this down. This isn't the right one. This is the common interpretation. And that is that the treasure and the pearl are Jesus Christ. And that we are the men, we are the people who are seeking for them. And when we find them, we must sell everything that we have in order that we might have him. But that's a mistaken interpretation. Because we know from life, and more importantly, we know from Scripture that the sinner is never on a search for God. Ever. Romans 3.11 says there is no one who seeks God. Right from the beginning, when Adam sinned, what did he do? He said, oh man, I've sinned. I'm going to go search for God. No, he didn't do that. When he sinned, he hid from God. And God has gone searching for mankind ever since. So this parable cannot be about a man hunting for God because after he finds the pearl, he buys it. Let me tell you something. You don't have enough money to purchase salvation. You don't have enough gifts to purchase salvation. You don't have enough worth to purchase salvation. Therefore, we're, let's just set that aside. Okay, now, if we're going to follow the suggestions that Jesus has given us in these other parables, he has interpreted some of the elements, and we're going to again have our clues by taking the meanings from them. The man who is searching for the pearl is, of course, Jesus. He's been the man in all of these parables. It's Jesus. He's the sower that went out to sow. 
He's the one that scattered the sons of the kingdom throughout the world. He is the one that planted the mustard seed in the field. Throughout the parables, Jesus is the one that is active in the midst of our age. So it's Jesus who comes, who's a merchant seeking fine pearls. Now this is an oriental picture, and it's strange that Jesus would use this to most of his Jewish audience. Because the Hebrew people never valued pearls. Did you know that? Never valued pearls. One of the strange things about the Old Testament is that though you find many jewels and gems mentioned there, diamonds and rubies and sapphires and topazes, you'll find no mention of a pearl in any of the Old Testament describing what's in the tabernacle, what's in their possessions, not pearls. No pearls. For some reason, the Hebrew people didn't think much of them. But these disciples were Galileans. And Galilee was a region to which many Gentiles came. So they were familiar with Gentile traders who came looking for valuable pearls and would pay fabulous, enormous prices for them in order to purchase. Not for themselves, but for their kings. So the disciples understood the symbol that our Lord is using. A merchant comes and he's seeking pearls and he finds one of great value. And in order to obtain it, he has to sell everything that he has. Now, same kind of activity as in the treasure hidden in the field. He gave all that he had. And we said last week, and I'll remind you again, that this is a picture of the cross of our Lord. He gave himself. As Isaiah says in Isaiah 53, 12, he poured out his soul unto death. Paul tells us in Philippians 2 that he emptied himself. He exhausted the treasury. He pauperized himself. He gave all that he had literally and truly in order that he might purchase the field containing the treasure. For those of you that have gone through the truth series with me, you remember the story of the ants and how this person who fell in love with ants wanted to know uh, just how he could relate to them that he was their benefactor, that he was the one that cared about them and loved them. And the answer to that is that I said, as you are a human being, the way to do that is you'd have to turn yourself into an ant. So you could see the world through their eyes and hear what they hear and feel what they feel. And when I'm in your home drinking your coffee, eating your sweet rolls or brownies or cookies or whatever else that you feed me that's yummy, I flat out ask you if you would ever consider being willing to turn yourself into an ant. And not one of you said, oh, I'm so glad you asked that because that's been a desire of mine all my life. No, nobody wants to be an ant. Wow, that'd be right up there with a slug. <laughs> There's another aspect of the work of the cross. Our, lay, our Lord came to this world and seeing the church as God sees it, with his view of history clear to the end of the age, already complete and worth so much because it was going to be his bride. He gave all that he had so that he could obtain it. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. I, I'm sure Paul had this parable in mind. The Holy Spirit prompted him to think of this parable as he wrote this down. Ephesians chapter 5, the last half of verse 25 says, Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, 
And then verse 27, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Three things I want you to see this morning about this precious pearl, the strange case of the precious pearl. I want you to see how this pearl was wrought. Now, we don't use that word anymore, but I was trying to be illiterate, you know, have all the things go together. So I come up with that word. How the pearl was wrought how the pearl was bought, and how the pearl was sought. You see why I come up with wrought? Goes together. And when we finish, I'm praying that you're going to be thanking God for the wonderful salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus. Now, why did our Lord choose the symbol of a pearl for the church? Why didn't he use a ruby or, or a diamond or, you know, an emerald. Why did he use a pearl? Well, the answer might be that the pearl is the only jewel which is the product of living matter. A pearl is the response of an oyster to something that gives it injury. A pearl grows out of hurt. How is a pearl wrought or formed? How is a pearl formed? <laughs> that doesn't go with sought and bought, so I don't use it. Well, you probably know how a pearl is formed. A little particle of sand, some alien substance, gets inside the shell of an oyster. It's kind of like having uh, crumbs in bed. Maybe you don't know what crumbs in bed are like because you are a little old, but uh, if you have a uh, toddler in bed with you, eating cookies or crackers or candy bars, or chips, pretzels. I mean, you name it, they eat it. You're going to have crumbs in your bed. I know I do the laundry at home, and praise God, Bruce is six now, so he doesn't do that, but when he was little, whoo, man, take those sheets out before he could wash them and my neighbors knew when I was doing laundry because I was out, out on the stoop shaking out the sheets and I want that food in my, wa in my washing machine. I mean, you get, the, you get that crumbs in your sheets. Ooh, man. I don't want to sleep with that. And because the oyster has no hands to brush the irritant away, no means of defense except to transfer, uh, uh, transform the thing that's injuring it. And what an apt and beautiful symbol that uh, our Lord has chosen for the church. Because the response of an oyster to that which irritates it is to change it and transform it into something that's no longer a source of irritation. And the pearl, like the church, is formed from start to finish. You see, the pearl grows layer by layer. Gradually, indivisibly, no blemish if it's a perfect pearl. It cannot be divided. It cannot be carved. There, in this parable, I want you to notice that it was a pearl. There, there are no churches. There's not two churches. There are no churches. In the end, there's just one church. Just one. It's a church without spot or wrinkle or any blemish whatsoever. Now, if you've been in churches any time of your life, you probably know that uh, uh, that was one of the things that all churches think, that they're the only ones going to heaven. One of the reasons I have always loved the Restoration Movement and what we are a part of is very early in their history, they had a, a phrase that really describes how we should think. And that is this, we don't believe we're the only Christians. We believe we're Christians only. See, there's a major difference, a major difference. We're just trying to be Christians. There's just one church. 
So this pearl of great price represents the church, and you, and you see how it was wrought. Now I want you to see how it was bought. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. When a man says all that he has, do you know what he is at that moment? Bankrupt. He's bankrupt. Think of the price that Jesus paid. He became a pauper. Jesus came to a manger that you and I might go to a mansion. Listen, God doesn't love us because we're valuable. We're valuable because God loves us. Nothing we've considered up to this point has even begun to exhaust the implications of that phrase in Matthew 13. He went and sold all that he had and bought it. And I wonder sometimes if we're even able to grasp what that means, the significance about it. We dwell on the agony of the cross, its physical hurt, its anguish, the injury, the pain, the thirst, the tears... The darkness, the death, our Lord went through all of that and, and, and we focus on that. But that isn't really what the cost was all about. We won't begin to understand until we see something of the personal and emotional cost involved in the cross. I mean, we even sing about the, the blood and the death and the wounds and the thirsting and the pain. But it goes so far deeper than that. It involves the hurt in the heart of God as he fully identifies with us in our agony and extends his forgiveness. You see, healing human hurt is God's business. The cross is God's answer to the hurt that humanity has caused. And this is a hurting race that we belong to, isn't it? I don't know that there's ever been a generation that is more aware of the hurt of human hearts. I know there was bullying when your preacher was in school. But I wasn't aware of other kids that went through it. But today... In your grandchildren's classes, in your children's classes, in your great-grandchildren's classes, there is bullying going on at an alarming rate. Children that are being abused by other children. And oh, that song that Britain sang. Not only was it beautiful, but it was so educational it was so true it was so truth telling we get hurt because of what people tell us about ourselves and we're damaged and we come into this building damaged people because we don't get a lot of praise and a lot of thanks and a lot of encouragement because everyone is willing and anxious to step on us in order to rise above. And so the church becomes a sanctuary where we're all equal. And the one thing that we have in common is that Jesus loves us just as I am. You know, I, I, I'm positive that uh, once in a while, all of you, maybe not all of you, because some of you are pretty gifted, but I know probably some of you at least have had uh, uh, someone come to help you. You're in a bad place. 
uh, uh, maybe it's financially, maybe it's physically, maybe it's mentally, but you're, you're, you're in need of help. And I can tell you that the last person you want to have come and help you is someone that's going to walk up and say, well, doesn't surprise me you're in this position. You're a no good deadbeat. Or how about this one? I can't believe that you are so ignorant that you can't fix that on your own. Do you know which end of a hammer to hold? Do you know how to run a power drill? No? Okay, I said it. There was a reason that my dad wouldn't let me have a chainsaw until I was 63 years old. I mean, I'm not what you'd call good with tools, but the last thing I want is someone to stand beside me and say, well, before I help you, can I just tell you what a waste you are? No, I really don't want that kind of help. Please don't come over. I could put up the hood of a car and look in it and think, wow, that's, a, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, but could you fix it? Are you kidding me? No. When we're in trouble and we want people to help us, we don't want people to berate us before they help us. Do we? Anybody here looking to be berated before you get help? Because I know some people that are real good at it. And if, if self-righteousness, I mean, if someone says, I can't believe that you are involved in that, when I was little, and I got in trouble, my mom would say to me, Bruce, Go up to your room, put your pajamas on, and get in bed. Didn't matter what time of day it was. I didn't know anything about time change because I slept a lot. <laughs> well, I was just a toddler, and we had a uh, we had a, a, a storm door. You know what those are? Storm doors. They, they, sometimes the glass slides up and down, and in the summertime, it's a screen where the air can come in, and you put the glass up, and then it's, it's a winter storm door. We had one of those, but it didn't really catch. And my mom, I don't know where she was in the house, but I was just playing innocently, one of the times that I wasn't doing something wrong. And the wind caught that door and opened it up and slammed it shut, and the glass broke. My mom heard the noise. When she came to look, I was gone. She called a couple of times, and finally she walked up the stairs, and there I was in my room, putting my pajamas on. Because <laughs> if something was going to be in trouble in my house, it was going to be me. I knew it. I didn't know what happened. I just heard the crash. I saw the glass. I said, bedtime, Bruce, get up there. <laughs> See, I, I would have rather climbed into bed than face my parents. We're in the church. We don't often get this idea. But when Jesus came to seek us, there's a problem because we're afraid of him. We don't want to be in his presence. We don't feel worthy. And so we hide. And so we run. We make it sound so simple, evangelism, where you just go out and you talk to people about Jesus. That, that's not how it happens. Because people don't want to hear a self-righteous message when they're so unrighteous. But I want you to see how this pearl was sought. How did he reach us? Oh, he did something that is so amazing. We just can't 
comprehend it. When we're in trouble, I don't care what it is. If we would just wait a minute and settle down and look to either side of us, we would see Jesus right there. We've got the idea that when we sin or when we're in trouble, Jesus abandons us, and he doesn't. I would tell you that even if you were being crucified, hanging on a cross, you could look to your side and Jesus would be hanging there with you. That's how much he loves you. And that's how he sought us. He became us so that he could feel what we feel, see what we see and hear what we hear. Wonder of wonders that Jesus was seeking me. You are so precious. Luke 19.10 says, The Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. And one of my old-time favorite gospel hymns, I was sinking deep in sin, far from that peaceful shore. So very deeply stained with sin, I, I was sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard that despairing cry, and from those waters lifted me. How safe am I? Jesus didn't understand all there was to be understood about us while he walked this earth. He saw the pain, he saw the heartache, he saw the anger, he saw the jealousy, he saw the envy, he saw the negatives of society when he was here among us. But he didn't feel what we feel until he went and hung on that cross and his own Father God laid on him your sin and mine. And then he felt uncleanness. And then he felt guilt. And then he felt shame. And he said, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when he went to heaven to sit at the right hand of God as our mediator, I want to tell you this morning, he remembers that. And he's not about to forsake you. Because he died to rescue you. What more perfect symbol than a pearl could ever be given? Well, I want you to notice something, and I've got to cut this short because I'm out of time. Well, I'm not. It just says 2.39. I've got a lot of time to preach yet. I kept like, oh, man, don't, don't worry about it. I've got two minutes. I want you to notice something. The treasure hidden in the field, Jesus buys the field of humanity, and he leaves it there. That's, that was the world. He, 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 he bought the world, John 3, 16. But what about, what about the pearl? There's no mention of the field in connection with the pearl. Yes, the church, he, he, he brought the church out of souring humanity. But the pearl is not ultimately intended for earth. It's intended for the heavens. That's what the pearl is being formed for. Our Lord is making himself a church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And when you're going through this hurt, when you're going through this process of life, when the troubles beset you and you're struggling and crying and sorrowing and grieving, I want you to know something. That the church of which you are a part of, Jesus is taking that healing nacre and he's covering your life with it over and over and over and over even as you're going through this hurt and this pain. And when you're finished, you're going to be a pearl. Gorgeous, valuable, 
God isn't through with us. He's working our problems. He's working us to be beneficial to others. And this is how Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians. He says, This slight momentary affliction is preparing for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. No wonder our heavenly home has as its entrance pearly gates. Because the ones who are going through are the ones that have been wounded, bruised, and have responded by allowing our precious Savior and Lord to turn our wounded lives into beautiful pearls. If you're ready to have your life changed today, then why not come and talk to me after we stand and sing Hymn number 482. Our God's amazing, isn't he? How he uses something like a pearl. Not only to describe the heartache and the sorrows that we go through, but how he fixes that. That's what our church is made up of. Tell somebody about that this week. Don't talk about gold, diamonds. Talk about pearls. Would you pray with me, please? Father, as we leave this building, we rejoice in the church of which we're a part. And we're just awestruck at how much you went through to purchase us. We love you. I pray that we would live for you this week for your glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.